the first record I remember buying on my own with my own money it was uh, Kiss, Rock and Roll All Over. I think maybe Out of Our Heads by the Rolling Stones. Either the blue or the red, like Beatles compilation. A Ravi Shankar record at a yard sale, probably about eight years, when I was eight years old. Aerosmith Permanent Vacation. And I bought that through the BMG Club, which I uh, definitely yeah. exploited. I'm old enough to say that I was of the age to tape the penny onto the card and send it in for free goods under a false name. Pink Floyd's Relics. The Beach Boys' Little Deuce Coop. Who's next, I think? In 1959, the Belafonte at Carnegie Hall album. It was a 45 by a group called Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, and they had a song called I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent. I told uh, my sister I wanted a record player for Christmas, and she let me know she was getting me that. So rather than leave it up to anyone else, I went out and bought myself records and wrapped them and put them under the tree. Um, it was Prince, Sign of the Times, Sinead O'Connor's The Lion and the Cobra, and Public Image Limited's Happy. Those Beatles uh, best of singles collections, the Red Album and the Blue Album, uh, you know, out of Corvettes in Jersey City, New Jersey. <laughs> you know? But I was like, you know, 12 or 13, and I wanted to own those, and I didn't, I didn't know independent record stores existed at that point. There were over 7,000 record stores in the U.S. in the early 90s, and now there's fewer than 2,000. The whole idea of a physical product being the, the engine that drives the music industry, which is essentially the case of the last 50 years of the 20th century, uh, is no longer the case in the last 10 years. People aren't going to brick and mortar stores to buy product anymore. It's certainly in significantly fewer numbers than they did 10 years ago. As most people know, there has been the single most dramatic change that I've known in the 50 years now that I've been involved. The advent of the internet and downloading and MP3s has changed the world enormously. When I opened up, Pavements Brighten the Corners was something that came out, and I expected that to be a big seller. I was close to a college campus for the original location, and I asked my customers, you're not interested in this? And they said no, that someone had already gone through the college dormitory selling CDRs of it from you know, a promo copy that someone at the newspaper had gotten the month before. Because we were in a position where people would talk to us all the time, they would say, well, I can get this free. And uh, probably by 2000, I could see the writing on the wall as far as uh, independent stores. Downloading and buying online devastated us in terms, and it still does, in terms of dollars. It takes us a month to do now what I did 35 years ago on a good weekend. Across the country, in big cities and in college towns, we have lost a tremendous amount of great record stores. In some uh, college towns, we've lost the only great store. In some cities like Chicago, we've lost half a dozen great stores. 2007, I guess, uh, we kind of shuttered the store and I've been online uh, selling off my inventory ever since. I did it for you know 27 years and you put it in 60 hours a week and you knew you could maintain it maybe, uh, but you weren't going to improve and things weren't going to change. Sad ambassador, broke America. I hadn't necessarily been there in the days when you know the store was doing really well, but I mean, just talking to Mike about like five years ago, we'd ring fifteen hundred dollars on a Saturday, and you know now we're 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 at a couple hundred. There just wasn't as many CDs being sold. Downloading has bitten not only the stores individually, but the general overall sale of CDs. I was one of the first people that carried compact discs. I just jumped on that when it came out. So, you know, I, I would embrace new technology if there was anything there. But, I mean, what was there to embrace? What, 
what could it, what was the next thing I could go on to? You could sit at your desk at home and, and basically get any piece of music you wanted instantly. So you've got a generation uh, that doesn't even know what the experience of going to a record store is like. On Lincoln Avenue, uh, right where the Starbucks is now, there used to be a record store called uh, Blue Note. It used to be called Rolling Stone Records. It was on Washington Street, right, right near City Hall. An independent record store in Champaign called Periscope. Pierre Platter's record store on Newark Street in Hoboken. We went open to like 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I would sit and wait for the record store to open. It was one big room. The middle of the store was all these cutouts. Remember cutout, vinyl cutout records? It had the racks all the way down. It was run by two music obsessives. He had like all the Ventures 45s. Posters everywhere. It was like $1.99 a record. 45s were 59 cents. There was a small stage at the back where people could play. I go, here it is, it actually exists. The New York Dolls actually exist, and I have both their albums right now, and I'm walking out of the store. I would shovel snow for, for a 45. I'd go in there, and Bill Ryan was a, a bald, chain-smoking, grouchy son of a bitch who prided himself on that description. You know, his dog used to bark when he tried to leave. And he takes pity on me, and he says, you ever hear the soft boys? I bought most of the the British Invasion. It was just like the greatest day of my life, finding those records in that store. I remember playing a show there, one of my first shows. He puts on the record and it's, you know, I want to destroy you. We're like, yeah, I'll bite, I'll bite, I'll bite, yeah, yeah. Just a uh, great, uh, great experience. I'm not one to lament the downloading and all that, because I, I think, you know, with the internet, you just have to figure out a way to make it work to your advantage. And when you can sell things online and have like, you know, literally like a global marketplace, um, you can find buyers for items that, you know, might sit here indefinitely in the store. And, you know, there's that weird guy in Sweden that's looking for that CD. We are generally appealing to people who are interested in the original artifact, collectors. But at a certain point when the internet shopping thing started, people stopped walking around and coming in on a daily basis. But then once the website started, it was like all of those people just sort of became internet people. I know collectors who said they would never even look on eBay, and they're on there, or Amazon, or whatever vinyl site. They'd be like, I can never do that. I couldn't just sit down and like read a title. It's like, really? Where have you been the last year? <laughs> Since eBay's been around, if I have a rare record or an expensive record, I put it up on eBay and sell it. And there are lots of stores that close up just purely because they can save money on rent and just go purely online. In 2002, there were five locations, and I pretty quickly saw the direction things were going as far as online sales. And as a result, I either sold or closed some of the locations once the leases expired and currently probably half of our business is, is done online. What it did was expand our world because now we, we deal in a worldwide market and we ship music all over the world every day. It allows people from other countries who did not have access to the things that we specialize in to have it at their fingertips on a daily basis. The reality is buying online is very easy. If you want to buy the new REM, it really doesn't matter where that physical CD comes from mm -hmm. because it is the same CD. So now you have to come in to this store for some other reason. I mean, I still like to buy, go and buy the records of bands that I like. It feels more personal to me. It just is a completely different experience than clicking. You walk in one of those places and it feels like you're in somebody's basement that hasn't been cleaned in 30 years, and that's kind of cool. And there's a lot of things to go through, and that's part of the experience. I'd like to say I personally built Wax Tracks Records in Chicago. I walked into that store every week and never walked out without spending, you know, more money than I probably should have. And it was all about what's playing on the stereo right now, what's in the little video monitor in the corner. I remember seeing the first public image limited video of that band. I go, oh my God. What is this? I have to have this. People that work stores like this generally can recommend stuff for you. Like if you're a regular customer, I'll know what your tastes are and I'll play something that I think you might like. When somebody comes in looking for 
a record by a specific artist, if you know about that artist and, and have a historical perspective, you can get that person started in their educational process. And if they're uh, responsive to that, then it's very exciting. I used to shop here before I worked here. And it got to be the point where I just walked through the door and Steve would just kind of lean back over and open up this shelf and he'd pull out a brown paper bag with my name on it, it would say Timmy. And um, inside would be like just awesome stuff. Going to that indie store was all about that curated experience. And I think that's the experience that people are still looking for. They're still looking for those guides who can steer them to the really good stuff. It's about, you know, find me that new band that I don't know about yet. I think, you know, talking to someone rather than looking at like Fall Out Boy Fan 72's review on iTunes, you know, if someone comes in and they see something on our pick shelf and they agree or they disagree, you know, they'll start a dialogue. I learn stuff every day from people of uh, different age groups who tell me about bands that they're passionate about that I may not have knowledge of. The social aspect I think is a lot to offer to people. Just the camaraderie, just to be able to go and talk to human beings. The thing that people get when they come here is that there's a possibility of a lot of conversation and relationships established. I've had people who've been shopping here from the first day that I opened, and they come in every single week. And you develop those relationships over time, which I think is a factor that's missing somewhat in, in the internet world. Facebook and Twitter and MySpace and, you know, the, the virtual communities that, that the Internet have created are, are wonderful, but, but they are virtual communities. You know, it's the difference between virtual sex and real sex. At some point, it is really nice to be in a room with another human being who is ex as excited about something as you are, you know, and you cannot have that experience online. And now we're standing in the last Independent record store. It's last independent record store. Over the years, I will say that I have acquired everything that I ever really wanted in terms of having records. When you're on that quest, it, it's more about the actual um, challenge of finding it. Sometimes when you find it, it's not quite as exciting as you may have thought because it's really about finding it. The top item on my list forever was uh, 45 by a British band called John's Children. And it was a band that included Mark Bolan, who later became T-Rex and became a huge um, star in the UK. And they put out a 45 that was banned by the BBC because of lyrical content. So the record was pulled off the market instantly and there was only rumored to be 99 copies available. So that became my holy grail for years. It's all down to a midsummer night scene. It's all down to a six period dream. When I finally found that and um, have it now sitting in a safe deposit box, um, that, that pretty much was the, the, the top for me. Once that was actually in my hand. I had heard the record. I mean, it wasn't like I didn't know the music, but um, just to have the actual artifact was, it was that holy grail moment. Yeah. Over the last several years, vinyl has started making a huge comeback. Vinyl has certainly increased in sales since I started here. New Andes. Something's gotta give all the need We do sell probably 80% vinyl and 20% CD here in the shop. And that's changed just over the course of the last three years. It, it was probably 60-40 uh, CD at the beginning of our tenure here. In the last two years, you know, you've seen like a 200% increase in, in vinyl album sales. A medium that was thought to be dead five or ten years ago is, is coming back in a big way and is now the, the fastest selling physical product in the record business. You now have two poles. You've got the digital realm, the MP3 files obviously are increasing dramatically, and then you've got vinyl sales with CDs in the middle uh, dropping. 
Vinyl is not cheap. It's at least as expensive as CDs. That doesn't seem to be stopping people who want to buy Smashing Pumpkins LPs and Smith's LPs and for a price that they'd be screaming if we were charging that much for it on a CD. They're not screaming in vinyl. It's simply, I think, because the electronic way people are getting music is so disposable that it started losing meaning for a lot of people. There's a certain impulse that people who love music, people who love literature, right, they want to own the hardcover book. You don't want to read Moby Dick on a Kindle. I mean, you can, right, but if you love On the Road or you love, you know, this is some uh, book, you love some album, you, you want to have it in your space. It still means something to have a hardcover copy of On the Road, to have a wonderful virgin vinyl pressing of sticky fingers complete with the zipper that goes up and down, that you have to be careful and put the piece of cardboard so it doesn't hurt the other album that's in front of it. I think vinyl as a format is very emotional and appealing to people in a way that other formats just are not. The CDs I can put on my hard drive and they'll stay there. If I need them, they're, I can access them. Um, I find them very um, tiny and breakable. I like having records. It feels more tangible and real. There's a lot of characteristics of, of listening to vinyl that probably appeal to someone versus just, you know, downloading a song onto your computer and hitting play and there's no real tangible thing that you can touch and feel with that. There's just something about holding the record in your hands and reading the information, looking at the images. It's about the entire piece of art. It feels like a piece of art. It feels like a painting or something. And the artwork is there. It's beautiful. You've got the artwork that's very interactive. It's the sound. The sound quality is there. It's also about the sound. It's warmer. 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 It's less compressed. It's fuller. You get the full like range of... The highs and the lows and everything just... It has a real natural... More realistic. More intimate warmth to it, but that's all personal preference. I think it's more fun to play LPs. I think that's why people like to do it personally. The ritual of taking the record out of the sleeve and putting it on the turntable and dropping the needle on it. You pull it out, you put it on the turntable, you watch it go around. You're watching when you're coming to the last track and you're paying attention to what's happening on that record and you're reading the liner notes and you're reading the lyrics. 20 minutes later you have to get up and turn it over. And I think that's part of the charm for most people. There's something about 22 minutes on an album side where that's just about perfect. That's like you finish one beer, you finish that joint, yeah. and then it's time to get up and right. you turn it over. Or, you know, if you're in bed, I mean, you know, that's pretty good you right. know, for most mere mortals, right? right. About 22 minutes, that's, that's realistic. Yeah. You know? And then if you it. get up and change, you probably need a different rhythm by that point anyway. <laughs> the much older market never left LPs. They've been buying LPs all along for the last 40 years. The younger market are the ones that have discovered it more recently in the rock world. In the late 90s, there weren't as many vinyl reissues and there weren't a lot of younger kids coming in. You know, it was fewer and far between. And about that time, as more and more new vinyl became available, you know, and people could come in and they could find Neutral Milk Hotel on vinyl, it's like, oh, okay, well that's cool, maybe I'll go get a turntable. And then, really in the last four or five years, I think every Christmas I get kids coming in, oh, I'm getting my first turntable, it's so cool. <laughs> every single day there's somebody coming in looking for a turntable, or looking for a needle for a turntable that they just dug out of the basement or the attic that belonged to their parents or their grandparents. I inherited my grandfather's United Audio Dual 1225 record player along with his Kenwood KR4400. And from there I kind of looked through my dad's old record collection and he had every single Beach Boys record pretty much ever imagined. So I, uh, I went online and I looked up, my favorite band is pretty much Radiohead, so but I went online and looked up a bunch of Radiohead records and I decided I might invest in a few of them. I think kids are defining themselves in some ways by buying albums that they really love on vinyl as opposed to just an album that they may or may not love. You know, they're going to download that, they're going to sample it, they're going to live with it for a while on their MP3 player and decide if this is something that actually is going to define who I am, then I want to own the vinyl version.
It's actually been very exciting after being here so many years to see people coming in now that are in their late teens and early 20s buying turntables from us as well as buying records. When I ask them what the appeal is for them, some of them say they have a nostalgia factor for a period that they don't even know about. Buying albums, buying vinyl albums for a 19-year-old college student now is, is akin to being an art collector uh, on a budget. You can't go out and get that Picasso, but you can get, uh, you know, Funhouse, the, the, the gatefold sleeve of Funhouse by the Stooges, and, and think this is a really cool piece of art, and there's great music, and there's liner notes, and this is a, a cool thing to have. A lot of albums are coming with uh, the CD in it or a download code, so I think it's just like they're making it as easy for you to buy something cool and to listen to it as much as possible. I feel like the indies picked it up first and brought it full force by starting to put every artist that they had on vinyl pretty much with every release, vinyl and CD, vinyl and CD, and then they started to offer vinyl and MP3 combo with the CD, which was perfect. The effect has almost come full circle from when we started 30 years ago, which was that now we're seeing a lot more enthusiasm in terms of people coming in and actually wanting to have a record. Of course, the record companies uh, are recognizing this and are actually starting to do uh, vinyl versions of, of, of albums again. You name any current artist or group, and if you wanted to purchase their album, uh, actual album, on vinyl, you could. The majors have definitely, over the past few years, figured out that they can sell some, some vinyl, too, and even chains like Best Buy are starting to carry new records again. The big box stores don't really have a sense of what our pulse on what the record, record LP buying public is looking for. Nine times out of ten, the, the majors are picking something that sold really well, either on its initial release on wax or or uh, on CD over the years to reissue. They're kind of clueless in this deal where they are picking the worst things to reissue. Well, For example, Herb Alpert yeah. and the Tijuana Brass Whipped Cream, which you yeah, see in actually... every single dollar bin and every <clears throat> single record store, thrift store And in now America. at Best Buy, brand new for $30. <laughs> you know. It's very likely that the vinyl phase may come back on a much stronger level because there aren't as many CDs to shop for. I don't think it's gonna be a passing fad. The marketing of it has been a little more mainstream where it's drawing more people back into being aware that records are available. You see on TV a lot of times now, instead of holding up the CD, they're on a talk show and they'll hold up the album and they'll make note of, oh, and it's on an album. The mainstream casual music listener is going to stick with probably a digital format, whether it be CDs or just go all all digital with uh, MP3s. Anybody who's gotten really serious about you know collecting has probably started purchasing vinyl, and almost always when you go vinyl, you never go back. You know, this art form is vital. And it's revitalized, and it seems like it's in for the long haul, basically. For us, it's been a part of our business since the beginning, and it has its ups and downs and ins and outs, but it always comes back around to vinyl. It's different when you work at a store, what becomes your holy grail. There was a record that um, uh, Bill Murray did. It was a radio show. It was promo only of the Fantastic Four, and he plays he plays Johnny Storm on it. It was like a radio record produced by Stan Lee. He only went out to radio stations. Today we begin a two-week epic. Our heroes will encounter the world's most incredible supervillain, Doctor Doom. Once again, the Human Torch is flaming overhead. Something must be wrong at headquarters. Nobody answered my signal. Flaming fireballs, there's not a sign of life. Johnny, what were you doing just before you shrank? Well, I was working on that new rod of mine down in the garage. Boy, when I'm not flying around on our adventures, I sure get off messing around with cars. Hey, what, what's happening? <laughs> this isn't possible. Well, I'll just do what I always do when I'm in trouble. Flame on! Finally found that record. It was, it was worth every penny of it. <laughs>
I think that the means of success for the stores that are remaining and, and that I think will remain are diversity. You know, they're, they're not only offering uh, CDs, but, but LPs, 45s, 78s, cassette tapes, 8-tracks, bootlegs, all genres, new and used, imported, DVDs, VHS, B-movies, horror movies, a handful of Blu-rays, books, magazines, graphic novels, posters, memorabilia, t-shirts, etc. And they've become part of the community. Chicago is a large metropolis, but it has neighborhoods in every little portion of the city, so you can easily have a self-sustaining small business in your community and be a part of a neighborhood. It really is kind of like a neighborhood record store, and many of our customers that shop here have done so for a number of years. A lot of our regulars I've known since I started working here 10 years ago, and there are a lot of new regulars too who are kids. We've seen a renaissance, especially in the uh, record stores who are doing it well. They're being curated by music lovers who are stocking their store with, with cool stuff that has value, uh, intrinsic value beyond, you know, it's just the latest billboard hit. We don't really carry that many things that you're going to hear on the radio. We wanted to have a big focus on independent music, underground music, psychedelic rock, punk rock. We focused on being a unique store, more of a niche market for our customers. With MP3s and like with the, the ease of distribution of music now, there's been a lot more um, diversification. Things are falling into individual little niche markets. And with record stores, if we you know, find a way to deal with those niches well, it'll still be viable. People that are buying records nowadays, they want to go to a record store. If you know what people are looking for, have it on hand, and have a base of knowledge to kind of share with people, you're going to do okay. It's never going to be easy, but you're going to do okay. <laughs> if you have somebody in a shop who really knows what they're doing and what the shop is about and are experienced with the um, artists that they carry and can talk about it. I think that's what really uh, can keep a business active and thriving. It's like anything old, whether it's motorcycles or antiques, you know, there's going to be a market, you know, however big or small for it. But I, I still joke with my friends that sometimes I feel like I own like a men's hat shop or something like that or a cobbler or something. I hope the stores will keep going. I mean, not just record stores either, the small little bookstores, little bakeries and that. You know, when I opened this business, I thought if I'm closed in six months, it's still the best thing I do. A lot of people are going to work and just doing a job. And I feel like for us, this is not just a job. This is our life. And we're happy to share our life with people. And we're happy to make them happy. There's really no reason to be, to be doing this, you know, aside from the love of doing it and keeping it open and uh, trying to turn people on to new music. And I appreciate everybody that's still out there trying. I think that the ones that have survived may be able to hang in there. It's really the love of the game that will sustain whatever stores. If you can just survive, that's you're doing as well as a lot of people are doing it, but you're doing it in the world that you love. You go to no, his house, I don't repeat. he's I really don't. sick. He's really sick. He really, it is a disease. He's got, you know, three or four rooms devoted to CDs and albums. And and now, you know, like Gordon Lightfoot, okay? Perfectly fine artist. Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, okay? We all need to own. I own, still, my Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald 45, right? Good. And, and I own a, a fine Gordon Lightfoot two-disc CD best of. He owns the best of, right? And... 16 or 18 oh, Gordon no. Lightfoot studio albums. You don't need 18 Gordon Lightfoot studio albums. Come on. You do. I go to your house and I always look yeah, to see gotta, what's gotta, the most I, absurd I, single I weeded, shelf. I you got those freaking out. 18 Gordon Lightfoot <laughs> yes. albums. You'll never listen to that in your lifetime. It's just knowing it's there. That's the most important thing.